Hello everyone, this is Mark Hodanot. I recently had the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Larry Farwell. Dr. Farwell, a Harvard graduate, is the inventor of brain fingerprinting. You may have first become aware of him during the MAM Series 2, where Kathleen Zellner used Dr. Farwell's expertise to determine whether Stephen Avery was aware of matters surrounding the death of Teresa Holbach. I trust you enjoy the interview. Well, Dr. Farwell, it's very, uh, a very lovely opportunity to meet with you. Um, I've been wanting to speak to you for a while. Um, thank you for taking the time to speak with, with us today. Um, I first became um, aware of your work um, through your uh, interaction with um, Kathleen Zellner, uh, who, was, who mm-hmm. is representing Stephen Avery. And uh, in, in the second series of Making a Murderer, uh, your feature there in the work that you've done with Stephen and uh, with yes. Kathleen Zellner. But before I come back to Stephen, which I will talk to about him just in a little while, um, I wonder if you could give us uh, mere mortals a bit of an explanation as to ex- exactly what brain fingerprinting does in terms uh-huh. of that scientific interaction between the brain waves and what you're trying to achieve via it. Sure. Well, as you know, the brain, the neurons in the brain fire electrically or actually electrochemically. And you can pick up patterns from the outside of the head, from the scalp, when the brain engages in particular information processing activities, you can pick up the patterns in the brain waves. And there's a particular pattern called a, uh, a P300 memory and encoding related multifaceted electroencephalographic response or murmur, M-E-R-M-E-R. All right. <laughs> yes. P300 murmur. And that takes place when you recognize something significant. It's like an aha experience. And that is well known in the scientific literature. The P300 was discovered in about 1965. And the, the P300 murmur I first discovered in the, the late 1980s. Uh, my, my first paper on that has been uh, cited by over 3,000 other scientific articles in the, in the journals. So the, the phenomenon of P300 is very well established. And what I did with brain fingerprinting is I showed that you could use that brain response to detect what information was stored in the brain. I'll give you an example. We presented on a computer screen to individuals, some of whom were FBI agents and some of whom were not. We presented details about the FBI that only an FBI agent would recognize. So in the F- and mixed in with other things. So when the FBI agents saw those things, their brain would go, aha, and we could say, ah, oh, that guy is an FBI agent or, agent or that woman is an FBI agent because they recognize things that only an FBI agent would recognize. Similarly, uh, an individual who has committed a murder knows all kinds of details about the murder that an innocent subject would not know. Uh, Now, everybody's gonna know what was out in the newspapers, but there are details that are are specifically known to investigators and the perpetrator, but not to the general public. If we can show that a person's brain has a record of the details of of a murder or some other crime that they wouldn't have had any way of knowing except by being there, that can be used as evidence in, in court. And it has been used in, in court as scientific evidence. So that's how brain fingerprinting works. We pick up a particular brain response. Based on that, we can tell what a person knows or doesn't know. And we can draw that conclusion scientifically. And we, and we come up with a statistical confidence of, of that conclusion as well. So we can tell precisely how sure we are that that result is accurate. Okay, so and I guess the 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 joy of that is that the participant, the one actually being tested, can't involuntarily uh, stop that happening, right? You can't not think of something when you're aware of it, right? So, uh, yes, yes. Uh, if if uh, if I showed you a picture on this screen of your of your mother mixed yes. in with a bunch of other pictures of people you didn't recognize, when you saw your mother, you just aha, you would have that response. Now, once you have that aha response and you recognize the thing, 
then you can decide what you're going to do about it. <laughs> you, yes. can, you can try to, to, to look innocent or try to look like you didn't recognize, whatever. It doesn't matter because we pick up the information in a fraction of a second when a person first recognizes that the thing we're putting on the screen in front of them is something significant in the context in which we're presenting it, for example, uh, as details about a crime. Yes. So when you're, when you're presenting this information, let's just say in a, in a trial or court, setting are there yeah. any specific uh parameters around the presentation of this information that might be different if you're doing just for a private purpose you know um in other words it does the justice system require you to have an uh, an additional type of scope around the testing that you're doing to give confidence uh in in the process and for the in the jury in the case of a jury um yeah. for them to understand what's going on Yes. Well, in the United States, we have the Daubert standard established by the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. and it requires that the, the technique be, be testable and have been, been tested, that it be accurate and systematically applied, uh, that it be applied according to specific standards, and that it be well rec uh, well accepted in the relevant scientific community. Mm -hmm. So in order to have brain fingerprinting ruled admissible in court, which it has been in the US, we had to prove not only that we conducted a test, but that that test met those particular standards. Yes. And, and in conducting these tests, um, I presume that if, if it's in a criminal matter, you've got the other side. I mean, I suppose you're not really on a side, you're just presenting what you find, right? So. Um, and so uh, do you, have you had situations where I'll just call it the other side, uh, the, uh, the defense counsel or the prosecution counsel or whomever uh, have questioned uh, the merits of what you're doing? And, and what sort of things do they say to try to counter the science of what you're doing? All right. Well, in the Terry Harrington case, in that case, uh, he had been in prison for a murder that he claimed he had not committed for 23 years of a life sentence. And the brain fingerprinting test showed that the records stored in his brain did not match the crime scene and did match his alibi. Mm -hmm. So we had testimony. Uh, we had a couple of days of testimony from myself and from another expert, uh, Bill Iacono, on, on our side, <clears throat> and from <clears throat> one expert, on, on the other side. And in, in fact, that expert was one of the, uh, one of the top people in the field. He was, he was my dissertation advisor, Manny Donchin, uh, a friend and colleague of mine. Now he was testifying against Harrington and, uh, and essentially uh, against what I was representing. But some of the strongest statements in favor of admitting brain fingerprinting as evidence in court were made by by the, the <laughs> witness on the other side. Yeah, I mean, his words for the science were quote unquote, totally perfect. And I, I, I don't even claim that brain fingerprinting is totally perfect. I claim that it is, that is highly accurate, or I should say I publish in the scientific journals results that show that it's highly accurate, but I don't make claims about it uh, being perfect. But he, he, was, he was under oath, he was honest, and he was a, a, a legitimate uh, expert in the field. So he had to say, the science is good. The science is solid. The, 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 the results are accurate. If what Dr. Farwell's results show is that Terry Harrington's brain does not emit a P300 when he sees this information, that means he doesn't know it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I prove. I don't actually go into court and say, okay, that, there's your murderer. Oh, that guy's innocent. No. I say the record stored in his brain doesn't have the record of that crime uh, stored there. So then the judge and jury will say, well, all right, if he doesn't know any of the details about the crime, we're going to find that he's not guilty. Or in the case of um, J.B. Grinder, who was a serial killer, the record in his brain did match all the details about the murder of Julie Helton, and he pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life in prison, also confessed to the murders of three other young women no. based on the fact that we found the record in his brain did match the crime. But before I did the test with both of those guys, I didn't know whether they were innocent or guilty. I didn't know which way it was going to come out. I didn't know whether the information was stored in the brain or not. 
And yes. when I report yes. on it, I simply say, this information is stored in the brain or it's not. I let the judge and jury do their job of making a determination, all right, well, are we gonna conclude based on this scientific evidence along with everything else that he is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt or not guilty? Yes, that's fascinating. So I'm, I'm, I wanna take you back, if I may, just a little before all that and, I, and try to find out what led you to be interested in this area and, and, and how, it, how it came about as, as obviously, some raw science to start with, I would presume, and then you you saw some connection where this might move into something that could be a useful tool. So could you just give me a little background on that? Yes, well, actually, the background goes uh, goes beyond uh, brain fingerprinting. Uh, I was, as I said, I'm a neuroscientist. I, I was mm -hmm. minding my own business in my lab, measuring brain waves, <laughs> and getting all kinds do. of information about <laughs> what the brain was doing. Yeah. And a kid fell off a silo and was paralyzed from the eyeballs down. This was when I was at University oh. of Illinois. I got my undergraduate degree from Harvard, and then I went to the University of Illinois for grad school. And a kid fell off a silo. He was paralyzed from the eyeballs down. He couldn't move. He couldn't speak. But he could see. And we thought he was awake in there. But there was no way to tell. You couldn't ask him uh, because he couldn't, he couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. But our mm -hmm. hypothesis was, well... If he's awake in there, his brain's going to be function. We can develop a brain computer interface that will use brain responses to communicate with a computer. And then we hook that to a speech synthesizer and he'll be able to talk, talk in effect through a speech synthesizer. And so I developed a, a mental prosthesis. I developed a brain computer interface. Now, today, there are probably a thousand laboratories around the world that are, are doing uh, brain computer interfaces. But at that time, it was the first one. Most of the mm -hmm. ones that are doing it now use the same algorithm that I developed along with uh, Manny Donchin at the time. And what we found was that we could. we could. People could communicate from the brain to a computer to a speech synthesizer. And we published a scientific paper. The title of that was Talking Off the Top of Your Head. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, very good. Very good. <laughs> as I said, now there are a lot of people doing that around the world. Uh, and I thought, all right, it, we can get information from, from somebody's brain when they're not able to speak. What, what, what else could we do? Well, we could get information from somebody's brain that would make a difference in terms of uh, criminal investigations, because we could find out what people know without them telling us with their mouth or their hands. We could find out what people know and don't know by presenting these things on a screen and seeing if they had this aha response, if they recognized it or not. So I did some work with the FBI. Uh, I did work with the CIA, and we proved that that really, uh, that that was the case. And we got the correct answer in every case when we were setting up an experiment, and we knew what the answer was. And then I started to apply it in the in the criminal investigations. And in recent years, most of the work I've done has been overseas uh, counterterrorism work. Again, one of the things is that with respect to terrorism, the, the, the higher level bad guys, the, the criminal masterminds, the, 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 the terrorist uh, masterminds and instigators and handlers don't generally show up at the crime scene and get themselves caught, yes. but yet they have that record stored in their brain. So we can detect the record of the crime stored in the brain, even if they weren't there because they know all the details. So we, we can inter intercept uh, coded communications with the, with the perpetrators and with, with the handlers about what is going to be taking place and what resources are going to use, who's going to be involved, and so on. And so we are able then to detect some of the higher up people in the terrorism realm. Another thing that we do, as we did with Harrington, where he was innocent, somebody may be in the wrong place at the wrong time and may, and may just be picked up when he was completely innocent and we can yes, also show yes. that so we've, we've done that as well we've shown that people who are terrorist suspects are, are not in fact terrorists yes I, I I'm, I'm guessing um that one of the real challenges although for you it's probably straightforward is selecting the right questions or the right things to present so that because if you're trying to establish whether someone is aware of something, you could be aware by virtue of being involved or you could be aware by virtue of hearing about it in the news or watching something on television. So, right. so 
selecting the things that they wouldn't otherwise be aware of through other sources must be quite the challenge to make sure there's reliability in what you're testing. Yes, there. Yes, it is. It is. And as, as you say, it's extremely important that we test uh, items, information about the crime that would be known by the perpetrator, but had not been released to the public, wouldn't be known by, by the public. Because uh, obviously, if, if you test, if somebody knows something that was in the newspaper yesterday, that has nothing to do with whether they committed the crime. All that means is they read the newspaper. Correct. Uh, similarly, if someone heard about this information in interrogations earlier on or in a prior trial, that's information we can't use for brain fingerprinting. So it, it is challenging, especially in a case, in, in a, a, an older case that has been through some court proceedings already and investigations, the suspect already knows a lot about the crime for reasons that have nothing to do with whether he did it or not, but have to do with the investigation and pre yeah. prior testimony and so on. So it, it is quite a, a task to sort those out. And what we do is we, we come up with our, our best estimate of what these details are about the crime that wouldn't be known uh, that, uh, that would be known to the perpetrator, but would not be known to an innocent suspect. And we also interview the suspect and we make sure that they're, uh, that they don't know the information for some innocent reason that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. uh, because if they already know it for some innocent reason that has nothing to do with committing the crime, then we wouldn't use that in the test. So if I take that challenge and if I may apply it to your work with Kathleen Zellner and Stephen Avery case. Um, yeah. And if there's something here you're not allowed to discuss, feel free to stop me. But I'm just wondering, I mean, the case has got such a rich history in terms of both time and detail and public awareness that right. trying to discover something that, that is uniquely um, not already generally known would have been quite the challenge, I, I, I'm thinking. And I'm wondering, wondering if you're allowed to tell us a little bit about how you went about thinking about how you would ask those questions of Mr. Avery. Yes, yes. And to be, to be a little more precise about it, we don't actually ask them questions. We simply present the information. We say, for example, uh, I won't talk about the Avery case in this example, but for example, let's say we have a, a murder and we know that the, we know the murder weapon was uh, a, a 12 gauge shotgun. Well, then we'd say, OK, Mr. Suspect, you're, you say you weren't at the murder. You don't know how it happened. You don't know what the murder weapon is. He says, right, I don't know what the murder weapon is. All right, so if we present you a 12-gauge shotgun and a pistol and a rifle and a knife, you won't know which one of those is the murder weapon. You'll say, no, I don't know. Well, then in that context, if we present the 12-gauge shotgun and he gets this aha re response, in that context, he, he recognizes what the murder weapon was, and that can be probative. Now, in the Stephen Avery case, it was very challenging because he, he knows a tremendous amount about the case from the trial and from his interrogations. Fortunately, uh, some, uh, another forensic branch of forensic science helped us considerably, and that is that Another forensic scientist who had not been available before the trial and whose evidence was not presented at the trial and wasn't known to Avery, uh, figured out using blood spatter analysis, figured out what had actually happened when the perpetrator first attacked the victim. And that was yeah. very different from what had been presented at trial. So if, if Avery knew that, it would mean, mean and he, he didn't hear it at the trial. If he knew it, that would mean that he had committed the murder uh -huh. because we're obviously going to know that. But if he didn't know that, that would be evidence that somebody else committed the murder. So we used ev new evidence that had been uncovered after the trial. The only way that uh, anybody would know it would be either they were one of the researchers who discovered it or somebody like me who learned that evidence from the other researchers and from Kathleen Zellner, who got that from the other researchers, or that they were the perpetrator. So what we showed is that Stephen Avery did not recognize very specific details about what happened when the perpetrator first attacked the victim. He, he, the, that record was not stored in his brain. So that is evidence that the, process, uh, that the defense can use to say, well, all right, he must not have been there because if he if he if he knew that if he were there, he would have known that. 
Yes, that's a. It's quite fascinating how um, that process unfolds. Um, yes. In 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 trying to, as you say, you're not asking questions per se. You're presenting images, or I'm sorry, I don't know specifically what goes on. Well, but images or words could be just, images or words. or words, and just see whether the brain responds as an aha aha moment as you as you describe it. Yes, that's right. So in in the course of an, an a normal year, whatever that is for Dr. Farwell, how often would you be uh, asked to do work in regard to criminal matters? Is it a regular thing or is it, or is it infrequent? Well, that partly depends on what year it is uh, because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, uh, in, until COVID, I was spending about six months out of the year in uh, classified counterterrorism operations overseas, mostly in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So I did a, a whole lot of work over there and I trained other people in various countries to uh, conduct these brain fingerprint tests. I, I, I provided my invention to them. Uh, so I was doing a whole lot of that work. Now, since COVID, uh, I have not done as much simply because uh, travel has been restricted. I've only been in the Middle East once since, since COVID started. Yeah. Uh, so it depends on what year you're talking about. Yeah, right. But in a, in, in a non-COVID world, um, prior to COVID, would you be regularly working on criminal case type matters uh, in addition no, to yeah, those, yeah. the covert stuff with um, overseas, ter counter-terrorism and so on? Well, actually, I, I do, in recent years, I have not done very much uh, local domestic uh, criminal work because there's been such a, a need for the counterterrorism work. I, yes. I, I've been I've been spending uh, most of my professional time uh, overseas. I mean, I, I was I was overseas more than I was here in the U.S. in the previous few years before COVID came along. So uh, most of the thing is, uh, uh, I have a finite amount of time and a finite amount of of uh, time to train other people. And I want to do that where it has the maximum effect. And, and so uh, I've been doing these counterterrorism work, uh, counterterrorism tests and training others because it has a maximum impact. You can, I mean, you may, you may solve one murder here or, or one uh, lesser crime here, but if you catch the mastermind be behind a, a major terrorist bombing, a major terrorist hijacking, mass shooting, and so on, uh, then you can, you can make a very big difference in a relatively uh, short period of time. So that's the kind of work that I've been doing. I mean, design tests, training others to design tests and designing tests to identify the, uh, the mastermind behind a terrorist hijacking or a terrorist mass shooting and so on. I, I, must, I must also apologize if you can hear something buzzing in the background. I picked the perfect time for someone to uh, fly an ultralight aircraft. <laughs> near my office right. <laughs> actually it, you were on mute, mute a minute ago but now that you're unmuted i'm not hearing anything interfering so yeah. i think we're all right no that's good I know it, it right. happens <laughs> <laughs> dr farwell i'm also interested just briefly if i could ask you about the, your work with brain fingerprinting and the early detection of uh um cognitive diseases such as alzheimer's and i wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that please sure uh when someone is a cognitively impaired at the say at the early stages of Alzheimer's before they're really going to show up on the, the regular tests, the brain is already starting downhill. Mm -hmm. And we can pick up using these uh, brainwave measurements, we can pick up that a person is implementing certain brain processes more slowly and less thoroughly than they were when they were when their brain was in better shape before Alzheimer's came along. So that potentially will allow us to detect Alzheimer's sooner and also to evaluate treatment modalities quite quickly. It's, it's difficult in, in diagnosing Alzheimer's and other cognitively degenerating diseases. It's difficult to get an objective measure. Uh, you, the, they'll give paper and pencil tests, whether they, they know where they live, they know where they are right now, do details like that. Uh, they'll have an evaluation from caregivers. Well, grandma got lost twice last month and the month before was four times. Maybe she's getting better uh, and so on. 
when we can actually measure the effectiveness of functioning of the brain, that allows us a more objective way of determining that. And uh, another thing that I've done in recent years is I've been doing a lot of work on how to use your brain more, more effectively, uh, to uh, not in the forensic sense and not in the pathological sense, but in the sense of regular people and how you can use your brain more effectively in your life. I, I've written a book, it's actually become a number one bestseller called The Science of Creating Miracles, Neuroscience, Quantum Physics, and Living the Life of Your Dreams. And it's about the neuroscience of using your brain effectively. And I also, we, I did research with my dad, who's a, a physicist, in the, the quantum mechanical aspects of how you can use your brain to create, uh, well, frankly, miraculous results in the world. So that's another angle on, on the kind of research that I do. I find that part of what you're doing just absolutely awe-inspiring in terms of the opportunity it brings to to humanity and the and the benefits that that can um, provide. That must be extremely uh, satisfying part of your work. Um, one of yes. the things one of the things um, I'd like to just, uh, if I could, close on and discuss with you is something a little left of all that. And I noticed from your CV that you're um, a black belt in kung fu, so um, I, I, which yeah. which must which must be uh, quite an interesting aspect of your work, and also that you, um, uh, you I can see by looking at you how well you look that you're a big uh, um, believer in, 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 and and um, and supporter of healthy living and so on. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your interest in kung fu. All right, well, kung fu, I I, I love kung fu and. <laughs> As a matter of fact, just, just before this call, I was on the phone with uh, Grandmaster Ki Chun Song, who's my, my Kung Fu master. I learned Kung Fu from him, we making arrangements for me to travel back uh, there to uh, in Illinois, where they're having, a, uh, they're having a test and they're having a, a, a celebration having to do with Kung Fu, and he wanted me to perform there. I taught Kung Fu for many years, and my experience with Kung Fu is that it is a very good discipline for gaining command of the subtle energies of your life, subtle energies of the body. It's not just a matter of being in shape and being able to kick and punch and all of that. It's also a matter of developing discipline and mind-body coordination and clarity. And uh, it's very useful to be able to have a quiet mind while all the, the feet and fists are flying around you. That helps, that helps yes. out in the yeah. rest of life where you can, you can have an inner calmness when there's all kinds of chaos going on around you. So I found for me and for my students, Kung Fu really, aside from being a good physical exercise and a good discipline, it's something that, that helps people to, it carries over into the rest of their life. It helps people live their, the rest of their life more successfully. Yes, and I, I can imagine, although not like you imagine, because it's real for you, is that that discipline must be extremely helpful in this in the science and work that you are you actually do which is very brain intensive right so to have that ability to be calm in uh, must be a great asset in the work that you do yes it is it is indeed and this, I, I think one of the major hallmarks of people who are highly successful in anything is that in the midst of chaos in the midst of challenges in the midst, in the midst of all kinds of things going on in, around them and in the midst of dynamic activity themselves, whether it's kicking and punching or whether it's using your brain in a, in a creative and intelligent way, in the midst of that, they can maintain a level of inner silence, of, of inner quietness, of attunement to their own consciousness, which is, uh, and getting to the quantum physics level, the, the, your own consciousness is the same as the conscious unified field that, that lies at the foundation of the physical universe. And that's something we've tested in the laboratory as well. So it, that puts you in a position to act much more powerfully and effectively and also to, to enjoy your life more. When, when you're not subject so much to all the ups and downs, it, it, uh, you're, you're, you have more enjoyable life. I, I can I can see I mean in the nat I mean I I I'm not putting myself in your position but in the nature of my work I'm very very busy um, yeah. and and it's very intense at times but uh, finding a, an inner calmness does help me um, do my work 
and uh, and whilst I'm not trying to make any comparison to what you're telling me exactly, but I the principles of what you're saying I can totally relate to in terms yes, of indeed. the work that I do. Dr. Farwell, I just wanted to uh, thank you so much for taking the time out today to, to chat with me. Um, maybe if there's an opportunity in the near future, we can have another talk um, if, uh, if sure. that's, that works with your schedule. And uh, on behalf of everyone watching, thank you so much for all your time today. And um, um, I wish you all the best in the future. Thank you very much, Mark. It's been a, a joy and a pleasure uh, speaking with you. And uh, all my best to whoever you're going to be presenting this to whoever's going to be seeing it yeah thank you so much i would like to thank dr farwell for giving us his time today it is most appreciated. To close out the interview, here is a song from Mr. Stacey Seabrook, a very important message in the pursuit of justice for Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey. Thank you for listening. Planet.